Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is wonderful to reconvene this final session of the law, excuse me, the Faith and Peace Day of the Nobel Peace Prize Forum. I would love to know what have been some of the most remarkable experiences that you all have had in the last few hours time. I had the opportunity just a couple of minutes ago to ask some of you what you remember the most and um, a couple of different people said it was when His Holiness the Dalai Lama said the word complicated. We of course are back live streaming again and uh, we will be going through the same procedure uh, with this final keynote of the day as we did with the first keynote of the day, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. There's been one uh, uh, wonderful aspect that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, Mr. Tom Weber from NPR News is down here in the front. Uh, Tom is going to be moderating the yes. Tom is going to be moderating the Q&A uh, section of this uh, final keynote session. I should give you a couple of numbers uh, that give a sense of what our global audience has been looking like. Uh, this morning we had more than 500 people uh, online with us watching and welcome back to all of you who are calling in and, and uh, uh, involving yourselves from Russia, from Norway, from Mongolia, from Colombia, and all over the United States. So we are part of a, a global event right here and it extends its arms around the entire world. So at this point, I want to introduce Alexandra Chirpy. Alexandra is a senior at Augustana College. She is majoring in English and journalism, and she is a 2013 Peace Scholar. Alexandra is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Alexandra. On behalf of the Nobel Peace Prize Forum and its tradition of honoring the work of Nobel laureates, it is my honor to introduce Sister Helen Prejean. Sister Helen Prejean is known for her tireless work against the death penalty. She grew up in Baton Rouge in the 1950s as a Catholic schoolgirl and the daughter of a lawyer. She became a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph and a Roman Catholic school teacher. In 1980, when she started teaching classes at the Hope House of the St. Thomas Public Housing Department, Sister Helen learned a bit about the challenges of growing up in an impoverished community in New Orleans, and she decided to dedicate herself as an advocate to those who are marginalized. At this time, Sister Helen became pen pals with Patrick Sunnier, who was sentenced to die in Louisiana's Angola State Prison for the murder of two teenagers. On his request, Sister Helen became his spiritual advisor in 1982, and her visits to him on death row opened her eyes to the Louisiana execution process. Sister Helen turned her experiences into a book, Dead Man Walking, which made the 1994 American Library Associates Notable Book List and sparked national dialogue on the connection between human choices and consequences in our system of capital punishment. Sister Helen's second book, The Death of Innocence, tells the story of two other men, Williams and Odell, whom she also accompanied to their execution. She believes both of them were innocent. Rallying support, Sister Helen has held vigils and marches to draw attention to capital punishment. She's founded a support group for victims' families called Survive. Today, Sister Helen campaigns against the practice, counsels death row prisoners, and works with victims' families at the Death Penalty Discourse Network and the Moratorium Campaign in New Orleans. Fellow peacemakers, please join me in welcoming our keynote sister, speaker, <laughs> Sister Helen Prejean. Nice job, nice job. Thank you. I'm glad we did a sound check because they noticed they could only just see my eyes above the podium, so they gave me a stool. So I feel lifted up. Can y'all handle Southern? Can you handle death and life? Can you handle crossing boundaries? And how wonderful it is even to be in the same place with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who says to us, 
I'm only a human being just like you. And that's just who I am too, just a human being trying to wake up, trying to, to do what I've been called to do as I make my way. Um, I want to just say especially to the young people, everybody else can listen to, but to the young people, one of the mystics in the Catholic Church, St. Bonaventure, said, don't pray for understanding. Pray to catch on fire. And I want to talk to you about fire. I want to talk to you about waking up, crossing boundaries, and coming into the fire, and then waking up more. This is going to be the prequel of the book I'm writing now. It's the preface to it, and it goes like this. They killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him in a wooden chair and, strapped elect and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act because he had killed. No religious leaders protested the killing that night, but I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now here is an account of the spiritual journey that led me to the killing chamber that night and the spiritual currents that pulled me there. So I'm going to take you with me, one human being to another, into boundaries that I crossed and came over. Because waking up is everything. You know, they said this story about the Buddha that he was walking along and people said to him, Who are you? Are you a god? He goes, no, I'm not a god. Who are you? Are you a prophet? He said, no, I'm not a prophet. Who are you then? He said, I am one who is awake. And to be awake is a precious gift. We can't really enlighten ourselves. We put ourselves in situations with people where we hope to be awakened. Because once we are awakened deeply inside, then we respond. Maybe it's what the Tao means by non-action. It flows out of us because we have to do it. And that's pretty much my story. First boundary was waking up in my own Christian faith that being a follower of Jesus didn't just mean being charitable to people, but it meant engaging in the works of justice. The waking up was about that the challenge of following Jesus as all the great spiritual leaders, the only way to break into compassion for those who are on the other side are marginated, is to realize that charity will never be enough, that it must be about justice. So the first boundary, which came through grace, we have a, a maxim in our community, the Sisters of St. Joseph, that have St. Kate's and St. Paul here, Never leap ahead of grace. I used to be a leaper. Sometimes I'll leap with grace. Sometimes I wasn't leaping with grace. But never leap ahead of grace. But when grace comes, go with it. And so that happened to me because I was at a talk. This nun was talking. Her name was Sister Maria Augusta Neal. And she awakened me to a dimension of following Jesus that I'd never realized before. That I needed to be on the side of the poor. That I need to live to leave my privileged place in the suburbs, go into the inner city. That's the first part of the journey of dead man walking, was the waking up. I came up in privilege. When we're in privilege, we don't realize we're in privilege. It's like a tidal pool, all like a goldfish pool. Everybody's swimming around, they're all just like me. Everybody was going to a Catholic school. Everybody had a really good education. My daddy was a lawyer. I, I grew up in the days of segregation in the Deep South, and the only way I knew African-American people personally was as our servants. I didn't even know their last names. Ellen worked in the house. Jesse worked in the yard. Never questioned it. And that's what culture does. Culture puts glasses on us and just says, so that's the way we do things here. It's better for the races to be separate. Then I hear this talk. This nun, that Jesus was on the side of poor people. And I went, I don't even know any poor people. 
like the little girl that wrote that essay about the poor family. She said once there was a very, very poor family. The mother was poor, the father was poor, the children were poor, the family was very poor, the butler was poor, the chauffeur was poor, the gardener was poor. I could have written the essay. When I woke up, I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects in New Orleans. It was less than one sixteenth of a mile away from the suburbs, but it could have been a galaxy. And I then came, began to be neighbor with African American people who became my teachers about the other America. What happened to you with the police when you're a black kid in New Orleans? What happened to you in the public schools when you get to be a junior in high school and you can't read a third grade reader? What happens to you when you don't have health care and you die or because you can't get a mammogram or you can't get dialysis when you don't have health care? I began to see from the underside what life was like. And I realized how privileged I had been. And it's while I was in that environment, while, it was while I was there, that one day, and this is the way Dead Man Walking begins, Chava Colon is coming out of the prison coalition office. He sees me and he goes, hey, Sister Helen, you want to write a letter to somebody on death row here in Louisiana? I thought, yeah, I could do that. Sure, I could write some letters. I was an English major, you know. I thought, well, I could send some poems sometimes. I could write to that man on death row. I don't know Buscat yet about the death penalty, you understand, because I was learning about all the social justice issues. But write the man on death row. Yeah, I could do that. If he's on death row, I know he's poor. I'm there to serve the poor. And like the, they were saying on the streets, capital punishment means dim without the capital, get the punishment. So he must be poor. If he's on death row, I'll write him a letter. I never dreamed they were going to kill him and that I'd be there, which is what that preface is about. But you see, we take a step. It's like boats when they're in a lock, you know, and you got to go from this level to this level, and you wait, the water flows, then you go to the next level. That's what it's like to follow grace, to follow vocation. You take a step to the young people looking, where am I going to put my one wild, precious life, as Mary Oliver says. You take a step. You put your hand on a rope and you start pulling. You start going down the path and it unfolds. You can't get the whole blueprint. I'll do this, then I'll do this, then I'll get involved with the death penalty, then I'll write a book, then I'll make a movie and an opera. No, no, no. <laughs> you write a letter. The problem was, the challenge was, he wrote back. The man was Patrick Sonier. You don't know when you do something that's going to change your whole life forever. I wrote him a letter. He wrote back. I wrote. He wrote. I realized he had no one to visit him. I wrote to him. I said, Patrick, I'll come see you sometime. And he sent back. He was so excited. A visitor, a visitor. And he said, look, you're, you're knowing I'm a Catholic. You'd be my spiritual advisor. I write you. I fill in the papers. I have no felonies. Send in all the forms. I don't know that he's going to be killed in the electric chair after midnight. And at quarter to six in the evening, everybody is going to have to leave the death house except the spiritual advisor, who will be me. And who will be there with him as he's killed and will find myself saying to him, Patrick, when they do this, look at me, look at me, and I will be the face of Christ, the face of love for you. And it's going to change my life forever. But we just start pulling on the ropes. So writing, then the first visit, I got to confess, I was nervous. I'd never been in a prison. I'd never really had two hours to talk with somebody who was a murderer. I did, I mean, I knew he was a murderer. He's on death row. Supposedly, he's the worst of the worst, right? That's supposedly who's selected to die in this country. And then they locked me in a room and a guard saying, woman on the tears, scary place. I mean, no soft sounds in the prisons, clanging steel and echoes on cement floors. And so I'm pacing up and down because the guard said, we'll go get your man. And I realize I'm nervous about him because actually I've never talked two hours with somebody. Are we going to be able to have like a normal conversation, you know? I mean, writing letters is one thing, and maybe he's like been giving me his best side in the letters, but what's it really going to be like to talk to him? And is he going to look different? I mean, if you kill somebody, doesn't your face look different? I mean, 
like, aren't your eyes mean? You see those mug shots of those criminals. And the guards brought him in, and they had him locked in a small cubicle on the other side of a heavy mesh metal screen. So I had to, like, look through the screen. And I went, oh, my God. He was so human. He, he looked like somebody I'd made on the street, and he was smiling. And he said, Sister Helen, you came. Thank you for making that long drive. And the two hours flew by. Mostly I listened. Mostly he had a listening presence and walked out of that prison that day, drove back to New Orleans, thought to myself, I'll come back. I need to come back. He had never experienced steady love his whole life. So I'll come back. And I, that commitment then, something happens inside of you when a commitment is a commitment. It's not just willpower. It's not purely an intellectual thing. It's not a purely emotional thing because emotions come and go. I know I must come back and I will accompany this man wherever it led. And so the journey began. Coming back that day, I thought to myself, we visited two hours. He didn't even talk about what he did. I mean, he must have murdered somebody. But I didn't feel like I should ask. You know, first visit, what would you do? Who'd you kill? I mean, you know, you must be here for killing somebody. I mean, you know, I have these sensitivities, you know. Uh, but then I thought, the first time I meet somebody, am I going to trust them enough to tell them the worst thing I ever did in my life? That that was going to take trust, and I would wait. And then one question I had, he told me in that first visit, that his brother Eddie was serving two life sentences for the same murder, whatever the murder was. And that was my first legal question. I didn't know anything about the legal system. In my second book, The Death of Innocence, about accompanying two innocent people, I'd take you through the courts and take you through the legal system and why it's inevitable that we're going to be killing innocent people in this. But I didn't know anything about the courts or the legal system or how the death penalty worked or anything like that. But I did have this question. So there was a murder. One brother got death, one brother got life. How did that happen? How did they decide that? Not in the, in the case of Pat Sonier and his brother Eddie, but in other cases where there are two defendants, there are no other eyewitnesses. Did you know that if one of them is willing to take the stand and say, yeah, he did it, they get a reduced sentence for saying that? Because there's no way a DA can get the death penalty without a positive eyewitness to say, yeah, he did it. How do we know from square one that we have the truth? And that begins to introduce the complication of saying that we're going to set about to determine who should die, what the criteria are going to be, much less to do what the Supreme Court has said. You're only now supposed to give the death penalty to the worst of the worst. Does anybody know what that means? If you kill my mother, that's the worst of the worst. You kill my sister, my brother, my child. It's always the worst of the worst when a unique human being is taken out of this life violently. How do we know what the worst of the worst means? And now we got a track record to show that over 30 years of practice, look at the profile of all the people who've been selected to die. Overwhelmingly, they are poor people, 98%, close to 99%, always poor people, and people who kill white people. Almost never, very rarely, if they killed a person of color. They killed victims that had some kind of status, not if they kill a homeless person, not when you kill the nobodies. We don't know what worse to the worst means. It's only us humans trying to figure this out, these juries placed with the responsibility of deciding death or life for their fellow citizens. So I'm just getting into it. And so I began that day that I would return, and then I'm going to wait till he trusts me enough, but I don't want to be naive, and I go into the prison coalition office, and I said, I'm visiting Pat Sonier and his brother Eddie. I want to know can I have some background information on the crime? And they say, sure. And they pulled out these folders. There's knowledge that changes us forever. And I opened up the folders, 
there was a newspaper from a little town of New Iberia in Louisiana where Cajun people live, front page, the pictures of two beautiful teenage kids, David LeBlanc, 17 years old, Loretta Bork, 18 years old. Their parents had sent their prom pictures. And there was the terrible, dark, big print headline, teenagers found murdered. And I look into their faces. And the first thing I felt, of course, of course all of us, and this is why we struggle when we hear about a terrible crime of these innocent, beautiful kids alive and going to a football game on a Friday night and their parents never see them alive again. The outrage. And the letters to the editor were pouring into this newspaper. What kind of animals would do this? What kind of scum? The rage, the fear, the strafing of the community's emotional life and fear for their children. The second thing I felt was guilt, like, oh my God, I'm spiritual advisor to the two people who killed these innocent kids. So I had this great tension inside me. Like on the one hand, I know that everyone has human rights. This man I met, I know that he's worth more than the worst thing he's ever done in his life. On the other hand, now look at this pain. Now look at these kids. Now these parents, worst nightmare of any parent. And I'm in the middle. And my story as a human being in this is to be plunged into something and being over my head. When we did the film of Dead Man Walking, Susan Sarandon, I'd hear her on the news stuff, you know, she's doing a little interview and she said, oh yeah, it's about a nun who got in over her head. She was over her head. And those are the kind of parts I like to take where the character is going to grow in the course of the film. Over in over my head is an understatement. I didn't know anything about the death penalty, didn't know anything about victims, never been exposed to such suffering in my life. I'm just in there. And then I think of the parents, and I think of, oh my God, if this happened to my niece Helen, if this happened to my sister, and I made a terrible mistake, and I had a great editor, Jason Epstein, Random House. I've only worked with Jewish people on all my books. We had great Jewish editors, and he said to me, Helen, you wait far too long in this first draft I've done of talking about the crime and the mistake you made with the victim's families. I mean, you downplay it. He said it was a huge mistake. You, it was cowardice, wasn't it? Is that why you didn't visit him? It was cowardice, wasn't it? I go, uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> he said, look, when you write your book, don't downplay your mistakes. Don't just take people with you on the peaks of the ways where you do it all right. Bring them in the troughs. Boy, what a mistake. I thought of those parents. Then I thought, they don't want to see me. I'm spiritual advisor to the two brothers that kill their kids. None of those families, the girls, the Borks, who had lost their daughter, the LeBlancs had lost their only son, whose family name died with the death of David. They're not going to want to see me. But deep down, it's because I was scared to death of their anger, their rejection, and I stayed away. I did nothing. I didn't write him a note. Nothing. And I met them at the worst possible time. You could meet a victim's family. It was at a pardon board hearing one week before Pat's execution. And, of course, it couldn't be more polarized. It's the closest to going in a Roman amphitheater where you put your thumb up if you want somebody to live or your thumb down if you want to die. You sign a book, which side you're on, life or death, literally. All the victims' families are packing the place because they've been told by the DA, this is your last legal hoop you got to jump through to get your justice. Who's on the other side of the book saying for this man not to be executed is me, one lawyer and one psychiatrist. So how could the victim's family not see me as an enemy? Why was I there to ask them not to kill one of the men who had murdered their children? And I met them outside the pardon board building when they had gone to vote. I was outside. They were outside. We ran out of the corner, and I ran right into them. The, the girl's parents, the Borks, who had lost Loretta in this terrible I hit, they came upon them first. 
Actually, they were very respectful with all the anger they felt toward me. They just averted their gaze like this and walked by me in silence. And right behind them were the boys' parents, the LeBlancs, Lloyd and Eula LeBlanc. And I expected the same thing. And surprised by grace, the LeBlancs walked right up to me. And Lloyd LeBlanc said, Sister, Sister Helen, I'm Lloyd LeBlanc. This is my wife, Eula. It's our son, David, who was killed. Sister. All this time, you've been visiting with those two brothers. You never once came to see us, sister. You can't believe the pressure we under with the death penalty. Well, I don't know victims' families under any kind of pressure. I, do. I just said, oh, Mr. LeBlanc, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't think you'd want to see me. He's the gracious one. He's the one who extended his hand to me and said, sister, you need to come walk in our shoes. I pray in this little chapel. Come pray with me. I'm sure when you visit those two brothers, they show you their best side. But you need to know these people killed our child. And it was an invitation. He's the hero of Dead Man Walking. And when I tell you a story, you're going to know why he's the hero of Dead Man Walking. Not me. I'm a storyteller, and I made some bad mistakes. This man. So I go. And we're praying in a little chapel. Catholic Church, St. Martin of Tours, one of the oldest churches in Louisiana. And I'm kneeling alongside a man who's praying through the death of his only son. And as he prays, I realize from his prayer that his prayer is already beginning to include everybody, not just his family. The Book family prays for the safety of all teenage kids but he also prays for Mrs. Sonia Patnetti's mother that he knew was having a very hard time in the town. He knew she couldn't go in the grocery store. She'd overhear people saying loud enough for her to hear. There she is, that white trash woman. It's her boys that killed the Bourk and the LeBlanc kids and that people were cutting up dead animals and throwing them on her front porch. When you legalize hatred, through something like the death penalty, how do you say to the townspeople, don't hate the mother? Be kind to the mother. Because you, we have legalized the process that this person is so despicable and must be removed from us. But yet, to say don't hate the mother, he's praying for her. And he took me with him. It's his journey because we all, when we struggle with the issue of the death penalty, please God, what if somebody killed my child? What if somebody killed my mother, somebody I love? What would I do? I would try to be peaceful. I would try to stand for nonviolence, but I know I would go through, I would want to take those people's throat with my own hands and strangle the life out of them. And so Lloyd LeBlanc tells me about his journey and he said, Sister, when I said I was under pressure, everybody was saying to me, everybody, Lloyd, you got to be for the death penalty or it'll look like you didn't love David. I never thought of that. You have the ultimate loss and you're not asking for the ultimate punishment. What's wrong with you? Everybody was saying that. He said, Yule and I even went to different masses to see if we get some priest in the pulpit at mass on Sunday to talk about Jesus, that Jesus had said we were supposed to forgive. We couldn't hear it anyway. And sister, you weren't there for me either. I had nobody. So he said, they're all saying it to me, and I see how Yule is suffering. I see how my daughter Vicky. We lost David. They went to a football game. He stood by the kitchen sink, and Yule had just bought him a new blue velour shirt, and he's standing by the sink rubbing his arms like this. It was a November night, and it was chilly, and said, Mama, this is going to keep me warm tonight. But it couldn't keep him alive. I mean, and the next time I saw my son was in the morgue to identify him. And there he is, my beautiful, our beautiful son. And you see, Lloyd LeBlanc was an electrician. I mean, he could fix things. He was Mr. Fix-It for everything. He said, the first thing I thought was, I can't fix this. And then he said a prayer that he had learned when the time, from the time as a little boy, our Father, who art in heaven. 
And he came to the words in the Our Father. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. He said, I said the words. I didn't feel the words. But in his heart, he knew those words were going to be the path that he was going to take. So he said all those people were saying, yeah, you got to be for the death penalty. And he said, I went there. He said, I did. I said, they're right. I wish I could pull the switch myself. I wish both brothers had gotten the death penalty. I want to see them suffer pain for what they did. And what I've almost lost Eula, my wife, Vicky, our daughter. Yes, bring it on. And he said, I went there. And then he said, but I noticed what was happening to me. I was angry. I was bitter. And I've always been kind. I've been that way since I'm a little boy. That's who I am. If somebody needs something, I'm going to help them. That's just who I am. And I was losing it. And I was getting to be this angry, bitter man playing in my mind how I wanted to see him suffer. And I don't care about their mother. I don't care about anything. Finally, his, and he did his hand like this. And he said, I said, uh-uh. They killed our son, but I'm not going to let him kill me. And he set his face to go down the road that Jesus had said to do good for those who persecute you, to pray for those, to forgive your enemies. He was the first one of all the victims' families that I've met along these years who taught me that forgiveness is first and foremost what you give to yourself. It was the saving of his own life. Maybe that's why that Indian proverb says, the one who go, seeks to go on the journey of revenge should first dig two graves. The Dalai Lama was referring to it this morning. That bitterness and hatred ties us up inside and thwarts our life and will end our life early. This that's why I call this man the hero of Dead Man Walking. I tell his story all across this nation every, every time I get a chance to talk. I end Dead Man Walking with him in this. So here I am, meeting a man on death row. Now I find out about the crime. Killed two innocent kids. And then I'm ratcheted along with him in this unbelievable protocol of death where... And if you ever look at any state that has the death penalty, they, are, they have to make public their protocol. On three days before he was executed, he's brought into the death house. He can bring a change of underwear. He can bring his Bible. He can bring his address book. A guard is stationed to watch him 24 hours a day. They go in shifts to make sure he doesn't take his own life. We've had cases recently in Oklahoma where a man on death row two weeks before an execution got an overdose of uh, drugs and OD, they bring him to the hospital, they pump out his stomach, they save his life so they can kill him two weeks later. You do not deprive the state of taking your life. And so we're talking about state power over life here. So we have guards now watching him 24 hours a day to make sure he doesn't commit suicide. He doesn't want his mother to come to the death house because he knows mentally and emotionally she couldn't take it. She had already had a hard life. So I'm it, going in to visit with him three days before he's to die, two days before he's to die. And I've been accompanying him for two years, this man. And I got to know his soul. He's the first one who taught me everybody is worth more than the worst thing they've ever done. I have his Bible. I have the Psalms underlined. Oh God, they seek to take my life. You are my rock. Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Oh, you are my rock. On you, I rely on your mercy. And the visiting with somebody who is going to be put to death was the most surreal thing. And that's the word Susan Sarandon, as we do in the film. Believe me, there's never been a closer collaboration for a film than Dead Man Walking because Susan, Tim, and I worked on every line and every scene of the film. She said, this is so surreal because I've been with people in the hospital who've been killed, I mean, who died. And you see them fading. They're not eating. But he's fully alive. He's drinking coffee. He's talking to me. Now he has two days to live. Now he has one day to live. 
Is the death penalty torture? What's torture? It's defined in the UN Convention Against Torture, an extreme mental or physical assault on someone rendered defenseless. Everybody has the same nightmare on death row. They're coming for me. It's my time. In their imaginations, they anticipate dying, picture going, trying to be strong. When I did walk with Pat, he said, Sister, I don't want you to be there at the end. He said, because it could scar you to see this. You just pray God holds up my legs. And in this book, where I did get to have a dialogue with Pope John Paul, that's what I said to him. Your Holiness, does the Catholic Church only uphold innocent life, the dignity of innocent life in its pro-life stances? What about the guilty? When you walk in with a man who's completely defenseless, and he's surrounded by six guards, and he's chained hand and foot, and he's being taken across this floor to that door where he's going to be put to death. And he says, Sister, please pray God holds up my legs. Where is the dignity in this death? And can you help the Catholic Church take a strong stance for life, not just for the innocent, but for the guilty? And you have to read the book, see what he did. <laughs> not just him. It's not just the Pope speaking out. The dialogue is always with the people. And when a pot boils, the bubbles come up from the bottom. The dialogue's happening all over. And then you hope for the moment where the leadership of a group gets it, finally says, changes the policy like it happened in our church. But this man that I'm with, and then this experience, and he had said to me, no, you can't be there. And I just said to him, Pat, I was so clear, just really clear. There's no way you're going to die with every eye looking at you wanting to see you die. You look at my face. I'll be there. And I was. And he looked at me as they killed him. And his last, I hold his face. I hold the face of six human beings I have accompanied to death row. The last two, as in this book, I believe are innocent. It's poor people brought. They get poor defense. Truth doesn't come out at trial. It's inevitable. I didn't know this. I didn't know anything about how this thing worked or what we could do. I thought we had the best court system in the world. But I knew this when I watched and saw that human being be put to death. Then I, I'd also tell the story of the guards, the people have to do the killing, like Captain Felton Cootie's in here, who pulls me aside after he had been through five executions saying, Sister, I'm going to have to quit this job. He said, as long as I was supervised on death row and just served them their meals, it was okay. But boy, when you're in it like this, and you can see they're defenseless, I know their crimes. I know the crimes of all of them. Some of them are just, just so despicable I can't speak of it. But boy, when you got somebody defenseless and you strapping them down and you're helping to kill them, I come home after these executions and I just get in my lazy boy chair and I can't sleep and I can't eat. And I just, I got to quit this job. And he did. He did. Do we ever think of the people who have to do the killing for us? Now more and more of them are speaking out. Jerry Givens, two-page spread Newsweek a year ago. I killed 62 people for Virginia. I was the executioner. Very honest, saying some of them we got. Boy, I gave them the juice and I said, got him. He had killed a child. I wanted to see him die. But then it was 20 40, 50, 60. Then some of the stories were coming up that someone might be innocent. And I'm saying to Ward, look, did you, hear, did you read this? He goes, Jerry, we can't. We got to leave that up to the courts. Just do your job, Jerry. Just do your job. And he get, he did a public confession to the nation. And the name, he gave the title of the article, I Know I Committed Murder, after 62 human beings. What happens to you when you participate in the killing of a fellow human being who's been rendered defenseless. So Pat is killed, and I walked out of that execution chamber, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I threw up. I never watched anybody be killed in front of my eyes. The crime is unspeakable. The death of two innocent teenage kids. I abhor that. But then I got to watch the repeating of the violence on him in the sad burial where his mother couldn't even come, the news 
people were haunting her to try to get a picture of her. She's the mother of the murderers, the sad funeral. Another mother buries her child. And I remember thinking that night in the dark outside the gates, I thought of you. I thought of all everybody. I thought, the American people are never going to see this. It's a secret ritual. It's hidden from our eyes. But I've been a witness. I've got to tell the story. And so I began. And that's what led to Dead Man Walking. That's what leads to my getting on planes and going to bring people into it. American people are good people. It's just that we've never reflected deeply on this. And we hear about a terrible crime. We say, well, they deserve to die. But we bring people into deep reflection. It's what spirituality is about. It's also what the arts are about. It's why the film of Dead Man Walking began to open it up. It's a brave, good film. Brings people fairly over to both sides and lets the audience figure it out for themselves. The theater managers told Tim Robbins they had never shown a film where at the end of it, everybody stayed glued to their seats till the screen went blank and then they filed out in silence because they're thinking. And Tim Robbins said, we don't have to preach it, people. Just bring them over to both sides. So here you got a guilty person, did a terrible crime. Okay, now he's executed. You watch both. Where are we at the end of it? What do we do? And that's the moral dilemma. We know this, though. We know what guides us. And it is that every human being has dignity. No one should be tortured and no one should be killed. Now we're beginning to find out much more what happens to us as a society in participating in all of this killing. Think of the jurors. In the second book, Death of Innocence, I talk about the jurors. Imagine you're ordinary people, us, we go in, they close the doors. Okay, now you 12 people, we know he's, he's guilty. No doubt about that. Now you decide, should he live or die? Now only if he's the worst of the worst. Worst of the worst. How do we decide this? And before, jurors couldn't even be told that they would get life without parole. So they really didn't know. They knew they had to protect society. They'd send a note to the judge and just say, what sentence will he get if we don't give the death sentence? And they wouldn't answer him. Now they have to be told, we can be safe. He will get life without parole. He will not be coming out of prison. Is that humane? Well, we got to deal with that for sure. But the first thing we have to do is take death off the table. We cannot handle deciding which of our fellow human beings lives or dies. And it brings everybody down who participates in it. So what a joy to be with you and to be with that. He's still emanating his presence in this room of the Dalai Lama. His Holiness the Dalai Lama talking to us, bringing us into the way of peace and nonviolence. And I want to tell you the hope. The death penalty is coming down. Seven years, seven states have abolished it. Support is at an all-time low of the American people. We're, we're getting there. And we're a people of life. We're not a people of death. And truthfully, it's hard to trust the government to get the potholes filled, much less to be in charge of life or death. So we look forward to your questions and our uh, conversation together, and then I'll be very, very happy to sign these books for you uh, afterwards. Thank you. All right. Let's go have a seat. Let's do encourage you, if you have uh, these cards here, fill out your own questions for Sister Helen, and there will be ushers coming up and down the aisles, and they'll get up to me. So that's, that's how we'll do this. And if you're also joining us online on the Google+, Plus, um, we have people taking in those questions as well. So that's how we're going to do the, the Q&A part of this. Uh, Tom, could we get the lights on so we can see their faces? I have or no control over the lights, rules? Sister Helen. I have you no idea. You don't know about lights? What, you're a specialist? Let me you make a call. This? Let me make a couple oh, okay. calls. Let's right. see what okay. happens. There's, but there we go. Here we go. Thank you. Um, it occurs to me we're sitting in a state here geographically that has not had the death penalty for, uh, if not 100 years, maybe a few more than 100 years. 
to the to the end of your comment, the end of your speech right there, how does what you've been talking about affect people who live in a state, and frankly a region, the upper Midwest, that hasn't had the death penalty for decades? Human rights is just as important in Minnesota as it is in the deep south states. And do 80% of the executions, by the way, the states that practice slavery do 80% of the executions. Uh, and imprisonment, more and more, the trend has been long-term imprisonment for people, even for young people. Rules get set, legislatures pass it for criminals. And the mindset of our country increasingly is toward punishment, imprisonment. And I know that Minnesota is not immune from that. And so it's the whole thing to raise the question of restorative justice rather than imprisonment and warehousing and exiling people for crimes, especially young people who have done, or even to look at the drug penalties and punishments for drugs, to begin to look toward that. And then to look at prevention. 90% of people on death row were abused as children. So the violence pumped into them one day is spent on an innocent person. So the care of our children, what the Dalai Lama was saying about the teaching of young children and some of the people uh, that I was talking to of working with young children and learning. To, they have a peace table where you have a talking stick and you learn to talk things through. We all have a long way to go in this country on that. We kind of grew up on violence in the United States, violence against the Native American people. We had slaves and brought them in. Uh, and our first penchant is to send in the Marines when we got a problem. So learning nonviolence, uh, and I don't know, Minnesota, y'all got Prairie Home Companion? I mean, you know, you help elevate us. I mean, uh, I, I was saying to Rose when we were walking in, the climate in Minnesota, now I know you got your problems, okay? But the climate here, it's almost like an ecosystem that's a little bit further along toward peace. And... Um, so it's good to be with you for that reason. It could be because the freezing weather clears stuff out. We, we really have <laughs> freeze no crime. We just freeze it. Freeze all out. crime. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Question here on Google Plus uh, from one of the uh, people watching at the American College. They're watching at the American College of Norway. It's a it's a general, but a, I think maybe a complicated question. What was the most challenging part of ministering on death row? Dealing with the guards with respect, realizing they're just human beings too, of talking to everybody. So when I, that was, I just kind of instinctively knew that. Because at first, the, it's like, God, these are the gatekeepers and these are the people who are going to be doing the killing and not to see them as enemies. So I learned to talk to them about, well, what did you do this past week? Well, been squirrel hunting. Well, good, you've been squirrel hunting. That's great. And just talk to them and get to know them as human beings. That's a challenge. Another huge challenge is not to hate the Supreme Court of the United States for what they're doing. Because they can see in the practice that it's falling out the way the practice is coming down, that it's the deep south states doing all the killing. And they refuse to look at that part of the Constitution, equal justice under law, and apply it. And uh, so I, I still struggle with that. In his second book, I take on Justice Scalia, who happens to go duck hunting with my brother Louis. But he's always that fifth vote that just signs off on the death penalty, and he even referred to himself as part of the machinery of death. So to deal with how they're using the law and interpreting the Constitution, because they never see what happens with when people are killed. That's an ongoing challenge for me. That's an interesting take to note the Equal Protection Clause, because I think when most people think about legal challenges, they think of cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, and it is cruel and unusual punishment. It's torture, but we don't have a court that recognizes torture, because, you know, we know this from the torture memos that came out about Abu Ghraib with George Bush, Rumsfeld. And they got the legal people to just say, how can we, with the people in Guantanamo, how do we get around the Geneva Conventions? 
So you legalize it. What do you do? Oh, well, they're not prisoners of war. The Geneva Conventions only apply to prisoners of war. These are enemy combatants, so we can do anything we want. And so you have somebody like Dick Cheney referring to waterboarding as a dunk in the water. And I know the lawyers that are representing some of the people at Guantanamo. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded 180 times. And one of the things about a military court is you cannot mention torture. So you have some of the people I've grown to respect the most are these human rights lawyers who get in there with some of the most despised, hated people in the world and defend them. Do you attempt to empathize or in any way keep from feeling too much when you're with a death row inmate? Do you try to have some level of disconnect? No, you can't do that. You can't do that. You're with human beings, and you go there with them, and you have to feel it. What is it, Khalil Gibran said, to laugh all our laughter, to cry all our tears. We want to fully be present to whoever we're with. So I know I'd be doing that just to save myself from the pain. We don't want to do that any more than anybody we love is dying. Are we going to disconnect from it? Uh, we can't do that. We can choose to do that, but it's there's something in us that calls us to be fully present to each other, whatever it is. Uh, so no, I can't do that. What do you say for those who say that the life sentence option costs too much money and that keeping people alive takes too much time, money, and effect? That's been the most counterintuitive thing to help educate people that the death penalty is far more costly than life without parole. I mean, you hear people, I've been on these radio talk shows, I'm not spending my tax money, keep that you-know-who. It with three hots and a cot the rest of his life. I say, get it over with. And then they usually ratchet it up. Just take them in the backyard and shoot them. I mean, get it over with quickly. You know, you have Florida with the, uh, the Speedy Justice Act. Every time now that you have a person on death row who's been turned down by their state Supreme Court, goes to the governor's desk so he can expedite executions. And that's a deep south state. He can do that too. Uh, but the reason it's more costly to have the death penalty, just check out California. They have 742 people on death row. The average wait for execution is 20 years. They spent over, two, and that's going to blow you away, $2 billion for 13 executions because they're paying everybody, paying defense lawyers, paying experts, paying, paying the prosecutors, paying all of the, the, the DNA, all those people, and then housing people for 20 years on death row. It's overwhelmingly expensive. And before we started getting into the whole thing of, well, maybe cost is going to be one of the factors that's going to help end the death penalty, then at first I thought, oh, man, don't tell me we're going to do it on the money thing. But then I read that Martin Luther King said a budget is a moral document. And we were saying this in the discourse that's going on in California. If you put all your money into going after the death penalty for a few people, then you're not spending it on at-risk kids. You're not spending it on health care. You're not spending it on Head Start programs because you're putting it into death. Have the seven states who have abolished the death penalty in the last seven years, which has also been a tough budget era for states? Have they cited money as the reason for doing it? Uh, it comes up in all of the debates when it comes before the legislature, always. And I mean, now that states, too, in the last several years have been in such a budget crunch, it's just like they're looking. And you know the American people are practical. They're looking at the track record of the states that have never had the death penalty like you. Then you look at the track record of Texas that's killed over 500 people. And then you look at the violence level in Dallas and Houston and you just see it doesn't make a whit of difference. And hey, what are we getting out of this? And now one factor too, Tom, that's really a, 
is the number of innocent people. Now we know we can make mistakes. There are 143 people who've been saved by college volunteers in innocence projects who were wrongly put on death row. You mentioned the guards at the prison. Have you talked to the doctors and or the professionals involved in administering and or making the drugs? Can't get them. You don't know who they are. They hide them. The last execution we almost had in Texas, I mean here in, in Louisiana, but got stopped because of the lethal injection and they're not complying to say what they're using. I heard they were going to have an OBGYN people, person be the doctor to, to witness the execution to sign the death certificate. Now, is that not pitiful? OBGYN birth is going to witness the death and sign the death certificate. And by the way, what do you put on cause of death on the death certificate after you've executed somebody? You got a hunch? Do you know the answer? Or you only ask questions. I, I do, do you know the answer? I do. Um, cause of death, what would you say? Probably the, the stopping of the heart something something. Something very medically technical. Medically like, you know, homicide. You got to name it. Because it's human beings killing another human being. You can't just give a medical reason. Heart refused to beat. <laughs> you got to name it. That's the only time the truth is told. You're homicide. saying that that is what it says. That's what it says. Texas says legal homicide by way of execution. But it's homicide. Um, interesting. We also actually had an example this week in the state of Missouri executed someone and that there's been a big question about the drugs certain companies are not are getting out of the business is that going to starve the market this is so this is helping to end it too here's what happened we go we're going to do it humane right so we move from hanging because if you don't get that knot in the back of somebody's head to hang them right over on the left side, exactly right, the person twists and strangles to death. So they go, well, let's move to the electric chair. That'll be quick. That'll be instant. Then we had Jesse Tafara in uh, Florida caught on fire. His head caught on fire during the execution. He had malfunctioned the electric chair. So then they say, let's turn to lethal injection. It's just like an inch. In our Louisiana legislature, they went, that is too humane. But then they said, look, we're going to be caught in the courts with this electrocution because the states are doing away with the electric chair. We've got to get rid of gruesome Gertie. We've got to put in lethal injection. One of the wardens at Louisiana prison said, it's going to be boring. It's going to be nothing to see. So we've had lethal injection. Then what happens? The Danish company that produced the main drug that was used for lethal injection found out that the drug was being used to kill people. So they go, well, we don't want our drug killing people. So they have refused to send the drug. So now the states are scurrying to these compounding pharmaceutical companies for the drugs. None of this process has been transparent. There's more transparency over the euthanized of animals. You've got to know what drugs, if they're outdated or not. It's all monitored, what you're using, what's your source, but not the killing of human beings. It has been, Louisiana's typical. We don't know what drugs they've been using, and they're not telling us. We don't know who the executioner is. They keep it all secret of who participates. A non-transparent pro process completely. So now, and this is Chris Sepulveda was supposed to be killed last Wednesday in Louisiana, and, and the Department of Corrections in Louisiana was told, we want to know from a judge what drugs you use and what the source was. 30 days before the execution, they didn't comply. Chris didn't die. Again, his third time, he's up. And we have something interesting going on. I don't know all that it is, but I have a hunch that they've had their feeling of killing too. And that why would they be non-compliant? They knew clearly what it was, and they didn't do it. So the execution didn't happen again. So we have all of this 
now where they're just experimenting as they did in Ohio with Dennis McGuire. They even said, well, we're going to do experiments with these different drugs. And it took the guy 20 minutes to die. His two daughters were watching. He had what you call oxygen hunger. They weren't sure what the drugs were or how they were going to work. So they're experimenting on human beings in a way you're not even permitted to do with animals. And all of life is connected. Animals need to be treated with dignity too. But we have had a non-transparent process of what the lethal injection process is. And all of this, I think, is helping Tom to stop the whole thing because people are going, what? Another guy killed in Oklahoma. It was experimental. They're putting all these drugs together they've never used before. And he went, I'm on fire. My body's on fire as he was dying. Question here from the audience. We work with a young girl who was involved in a murder when she was 15. She's now 19 and a half. You have not contacted the victim's parents. Do you have any pointers to make that contact? Wait, give me the scene again. A young girl was involved in a murder. Mm -hmm. As a juvenile. Juvenile. And, and this, these people who are working with the young girl, they've not reached out to the victim's parents. Have not acknowledged the victim's parents. Have not contacted have them. Have not contacted yeah. And they're wondering what pointers you would give, how to go about that, if that's something they wanted to do. You know, the le and this is where I made my big mistake. I could have at least written a note, and now I do that every time I take somebody on death row to the victim's family. I am so sorry about your son, or I'm so sorry about your mother, and just say who I am, but I feel for you. I'm praying for you. I'm so sorry for your loss. You can at least do that. So there are legal ramifications? Is that what you were referring to about whether you can legal. reach out? I don't know. No. So. No, not that. There's nothing illegal about that. That's just compassion for people who have lost a loved one. Sometimes the defendant who's involved in the murder will have an attorney who says to them, do not put anything in writing at this point because we are still in your case. And so they advise them against that. And so you have defendants who face a lot of these questions themselves. They have lawyers telling them, we don't want you to write to the victim's family. They want to write to the victim's family. And sometimes they write letters, and after they're executed, the victim's family gets a letter. Are you currently helping a specific person on death row? And if so, are you able to tell us about it? Yes, his name is Manuel Ortiz. He's from El Salvador. He's innocent as the day is long, and he's going on 21 years on death row. We are just assembling a new legal team <clears throat> to help him. He's innocent. His case was decided solely on an eye, this person who said, Manuel Ortiz hired me to kill his ex-wife for insurance money. Now that we're getting FBI documents about that guy, the one who said that, the one person everything hinged on, we see that he was part of a hit squad in Honduras. He was kept in jail even while he was testifying. Totally not credible. The jury never knew it. Everything was blocked. And so Manuel, Manuel is a beautiful man who said, I came to the United States, and he was applying to be a citizen. I thought this was the bastion of democracy, and, and he has been tried grievously now. 21 years on death row, and it's a privilege to accompany him. And I go to visit him faithfully. He is a friend. Rose Vines, who worked with me, goes to see him too. We have visitors to go. And who gets more out of that visit, that man waiting for me to come, or I who have accompanying a man like this who has been through? How is he not just a pool of weakness, and why did he not break down? What I get to see courage in people as well. But people who are guilty too, how do you carry that burden that you did a terrible crime and killed a human being and you can't get it back? How do you confess? How do you just say, I'm sorry? How do you, I mean, you know, just accompanying them too is a, 
I have to say I I respect them too. When's his execution date? It's not set. Twenty one years. It goes slowly. Very slowly. But we're hoping to get out all the stuff that was hidden at his trial. All the stuff that was blocked that they couldn't hear that this one witness who said he did it had all of this nefarious stuff going on and it would, would none of the see the jury can only go by what they're given at trial that's why you have all these innocent people because the poor jury whatever they're given they don't know things are being blocked they don't know there was another DNA that came out that it pointed to another person they don't see the original police report that shows it pointed to another suspect from the beginning but that you have a DA under pressure puts a spotlight with going after him and they go for that person and put him on death row and and then maybe college volunteers and innocence projects get in there and save lives as they've done with a number of people in Illinois in these different places uh, it just shows how broken it is that's what happened in Illinois you know, George Ryan, the governor who had voted to put the death penalty back in Illinois, and they kept coming in his office saying, Governor, it's another innocent one on death row. When he got to the 13th one, he said, this thing is broken. And that began his odyssey and journey away from the death penalty. A question from Google Plus here um, from someone watching online. How can people from other places in the world uh, participate in this in this discussion and make it relevant for our family and friends. How many people? What? How can people in other places in the world um, participate in this discussion, presumably here in the U.S., and make it relevant for our family and friends in whatever yeah. part of the world where they are? Well, all of these things for human rights are everybody's everybody's uh, participation is needed in this, where there are people who are political prisoners or what's happening to women and young girls the death penalty in the United States one way that people in Europe help is a number of them are pen pals with people on death row some people give support to the lawyers who take these cases especially in the deep south states um, and then when issues come up before the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights to just speak up for human rights in your own country because we do live in a global society and as things bubble up in the world community before the UN and we now have what is it 194 195 nations in the UN the majority of these countries now do not have the death penalty the United States is the only Western industrialized country in the world who still has the death penalty but it's to educate the people and so we're on our way to getting it out of this country. But we're all connected globally. We're all connected globally. And so people can, and through Amnesty International and international human rights organizations like that too. Two questions here about for-profit prisons. Um, what are your thoughts on them? And the one question here posits whether these for-profit prisons would actually advocate against the death penalty because it would keep more people in prison. Do you, what do you know about that? Here's what I know about prisons and for-profit is just like the zenith now of pushing this to the farthest extreme. The more we're finding out about how jails and prisons worked in the South, when slaves were freed, suddenly you have all these free slaves. So the first thing was the black code books that southern legislatures, if a black man did a crime, what the punishment was. If a white person did a crime, what the punishment was. So a black man could steal an apple, he'd be hung. A white person have to shoot a whole room full of people. And then you move to, well, how can we get these people working? So what you do is, if somebody was for loitering or whatever, was put in the jail, they found this in Birmingham, uh, they dug up all these bones of these people who've been buried. So you get like for loitering, you put in jail. Then you, you've served your time in jail, you get ready to get out, and they go, oh, you have a bill for being in the jail. You have to pay for all our taking care of you. So then you're going to go to work in this mine to pay off, and they never get out from under it. 
So extend that. And if you read when slavery was abolished in this country, there is an exception in the amendment. And it said, except for those imprisoned and indentured servants. So we have never fully abolished slavery in this country. So prisoners are easy pickings for private companies now coming in and you literally have slave labor. At Angola, our prison, over 75% African Americans in prison. Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, How Do You Have Massive Incarceration of People of Color in This Country? More percentage-wise than during apartheid in South Africa, you make drugs a felony. Many, many more white people than people of color do drugs, but when it comes to arresting people and imprisoning them, massive incarceration of people of color. Then you have felony on your record, and you can never, you, when you go to get employment, you have to say, I'm a convicted felon, you can't get a job, you no longer uh, qualify for public assistance, and so you permanently, and so she calls it the new Jim Crow. The prison industrial system in this country is alive and well. And even when you look at the Adirondacks, tourists started dropping off in the Adirondacks because Disney World was opening. How could people have jobs? We started building prisons. We quadrupled the number of prisons starting in the 80s with law and order. And we are an imprisoning society now, the largest in the world, one in every hundred adults, and one in every three young black men from the ages of 18 to 29 are in the prison system in the United States. So it's an industry, and all this is related to that, about private industry going in there as well. Do you believe there's a difference between the person who has murdered someone and someone who executes an inmate? That, let's picture the Dalai Lama picture, sitting in your chair right next to you, and I can, I can hear him. I can hear him, and it's what I believe too. There's a basic human dignity in all of us. Everyone's worth more than their worst act. So someone who murders, and then someone who carries out an execution, which is the most premeditated, protocoled taking of life you can imagine, but it's been legalized and sanctioned by society. But more and more, as I mentioned earlier, coming out saying, I know I killed, I know that. So when it comes to us looking at other people and judging them, I don't do that. I, don't, I just say both are participating and have done something, someone who murdered somebody. Often that's without premeditation, though. It's not to condone anything. Both have taken human life, and we know we don't want to do that. Anybody should do that. But I would never make a judgment about who's worse, who's, is there any difference. It's, both of them have dignity. i tell you what I've come to appreciate is these guards, our own warden in Louisiana, that gets it, it's your job, just do your job, Jerry, kind of thing. Human beings, when they are under pressure, do things that ordinarily they would never do, and I have compassion for them too. One of the reasons we have to stop this thing is it's engaging human beings in doing acts which deep in their heart of hearts, they know, or at some point, in some level, know that they shouldn't be doing. And we have to, we, out of compassion for them, I believe we need to end this thing. If the absolute worst were to happen... What's to that? Someone I love is murdered. And I'm the, I am now in that category of the victim's family or the victim's friend. And that rage is seething inside of me. What would be, if there's any way for me to think clearly, which there's probably not, what would be a logical first step for me to try to get through where, where you're coming you're from? You're in rage and you want a logical first step? That's a That's good start. Maybe. What is this, Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> Let's walk out in the cold. 
You know, I've, what I've learned too is being with people to just stand with people in the rage. When somebody's in rage, we just have to let them express that rage and say, and I want to kill them with my bare hands. Of course, you're in rage. You're in grief. You're in trauma. Rennie Cushing came in to visit his father whom he loved, is lying in a pool of blood in the living room. There's his father dead. Rage. I'm going to find the guy who did this. I want him to know who he killed. And unless I can really see his remorse, I will never forgive him. He goes to see the guy in prison. The guy couldn't put three thoughts together. The guy was a mess. Rennie walks out and says, I can never let my peace depend on his ever getting it together. He's never going to get it together. So then it threw him into, he said, you begin back in that reptilian part of your brain, flight, fight rage, trauma. And then he said, what we do is we seek meaning. We're meaning makers. What happens is as I began to connect with who my father was in my life and who he had been for us and began to tell his story, as I began to construct the narrative of who my father was, that is finally what brought me peace, and it wasn't related to what was going to happen. But rage is the starting point. And if we try in any way to say, oh, God help us, sometimes ministers have said, well, you know, forgiveness is going to be where, I mean, you know, giving these platitudes to people who are trying to, who are in the, the middle of this rage. We have to just be with people in the rage and let them feel our presence and accompanying presence. When we started Survive, it's not to try to get people to be against the death penalty that we start Survive. It's just that people can't be left alone. The big shock I got when I went to murder victims, families, support groups, everybody in the group was saying, everybody stays away from us. They don't know what to say. And we feel we have to be such experts. I haven't had grief counseling. I don't, and people just stay away from them, and they were left alone. They can't be left alone. That accompanying presence to just be with them as they lose their job because they lose their focus or the marriage breaks apart. Or they, all the things they need, they need the presence of healing community alongside them. You cheered up just now. Huh? You cheered up just now, earlier. I'm sorry, I can't understand. Oh, you teared up. I was, what, what was? I was being logical. <laughs> Fair enough. Off of that, this question asks, what is the first step in teaching each other to see ourselves as unique human beings? It starts with children, of course. Unique human beings. Uh, to just help them to be themselves, like the, a little kid was watching a sculpture one time and he was carving a rock and he said, Mr. How did you know there was a lion in that rock? <laughs> and we have to, kids show their individuality almost from the time they're born and for us to just help that to come out with guidance and love, of course, but, and the way we the way we talk to each other, we respect our individuality, you know, not cutting each other off, learning how to really dialogue, learning how to really listen, as you and I are doing with each other here. It's all part of being humans together. What influenced your decision to become a nun? I was taught by some great nuns in, at St. Joseph Academy. And they had a great sense of humor. And they had faith, and they were great teachers, and I wanted to be a teacher. And it was in those days in the Catholic Church where you either got married, they were the three tiers. You got married, you became a nun, or God forbid you were one of those single people who could never <laughs> find their way in life. And I just, the sisters were so vibrant and alive, I went, I want to do that. And I never was attracted to like marrying one little man, having one little family. Like, I wanted to go wide, kind of like, you know. And, uh, and the sisterhood is great if you call to it. It is because you never have to worry about what your work's going to be. There's always work. And, um, and you're nurtured at a deep level. You also know that you're going to have in life, in your life, time for prayer, 
time for solitude so that you can dig into things and you can pray and have that dimension, that mystical dimension in your life too as well. Final question here, and you alluded to it at the end of your comments, but you said we have to work on the death penalty first, but down the line there's a conversation to be had about life in prison. And what's that conversation? What does that have to be? It's already beginning to move away from throwing young people in prison for drugs. I mean, you know, drugs are a symptom in our society for something. And so we just automatically think imprisonment and punishment. And that's how we get that huge separation, criminals, so that it can be epitomized with the death penalty. These people, so dangerous, so terrible, the only way we can live as a society is to kill them. And then you have life without parole sentences for people, throwing people away in exile. Prison is a terrible place. You get a thousand signals a day that you're nothing but disposable human waste. I mean, we look at look at the 2.3 million people in prison. So what we got to do is we got to start with first of all, like let's look at drugs. What does it do? Shouldn't we be spending all those resources to have places where young people, especially poor people, they don't have the money to go to these drying out places where you can deal with your drug problem and where your life has meaning, where you can have a job, where you have education. When you're engaged in all those life-giving things, you're not as prone to do the drugs. We got just a lot of building up of our society from the roots on up. And so that we just, our first thought is not imprisonment, punishment, make people suffer, cut them off from society. First degree murder used to be punishable by life with some chance of parole. It's not really anymore. Should it be? Yeah, we got to find our way there. Should a murderer have the potential for parole? Absolutely. In time. In time. When you have a dialogue with the nation about something, you take things in steps. But can a human being be reformed? And can they, you know, one time a guard in the death house now, when we were going through the execution of a person, I think it was Willie Selstein, the third one that I was with, he, he said to me, Sister, the man we kill in tonight is a different man from that young brash animal that came into this prison cursing God and everybody. He's had time, he's reflected, he's read books. But we got to kill him anyway. The warden at Louisiana State Penitentiary, John Whitley, one of the former wardens, said, Sister, you know who makes our best trustees in this prison? Our people in for murder. Most people who commit murder didn't know when they got up that morning they were going to murder somebody. It happens in a situation. They kill somebody. Then they come here. And then they have the discipline of the prison. They begin to get a job. They begin, and we can never let them out. And our own warden at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, who is a tough guy, is saying we have a hospice unit. We have all these old people in prison. They're never ever going to hurt anybody again. But we have to keep them here till they die. So we got to go down roads of life together. And what part of it is a mentality of, oh, criminal and us. We, they, that separation, and that they're dangerous and we have to protect ourselves, put them in prison and throw away the key. And that law and order mentality started in the 80s, but now we're beginning to see the effects of it. You know, that doesn't it mean that every human being is redeemable? Now, the first job of a prison, as I've learned, is classification of prisoners. There are some people that you call sociopaths. Something's wrong in the wiring. See blood and love it. So they are in the special part of the prison so they can't help hurt other people. But most people in prison are not that. They're not sociopaths. They did an act. It was bad, sometimes with terrible consequences, like killing a person. And then you see them 30 years later, and here they are going about their job. I see them at Angola prison every time I go there to visit, and there they are. And they're 
they belong, they b join these different clubs, the uh, the sober society. So now they're sober, and the uh, public speaking. They learn how to speak. They, I'm okay, you okay. That was the name of it in the sixties. But just to be able to share your feelings, and they become decent human beings. And you, and I see them there when I go for visits, and I know they're going to be there for the rest of their life. And we just had a terrible thing with the Supreme Court a year or so ago decided it's against the Constitution to sentence young juveniles to life without parole or to death in prison. And so there was just hope within Angola, our prison. Oh, well, we have a chance to get out. Supreme Court just said it's against the Constitution because I was sentenced as a juvenile. And then it's thrown to the states. California, they put it in effect immediately. So I got to visit San Quentin, and they were pre... I'm going to be getting out, because I got sent here when I was 17 years old. I've been here 30 years. I'm going to get out. And when the news hit Angola, Louisiana, they were just so overjoyed. And then the word came. The Louisiana legislature passed, not in this state. And the Supreme Court did not make that decision in a way that made it retroactive so that it applied. If it's against the Constitution now, wasn't it against the Constitution then? But then they get involved with legalities like retroactive. Doesn't apply to you. It's going to apply to everybody from here on out. And the, the priest, this good guy, Father Bernie, who's there now, said the despair and despondency that settled over this prison because men who thought they had hope realize when they got that news, we're going to die in this place. We're out of time, and I want to thank you, thank you Tom. for this conversation, thank Sister you. Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Hello. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Helen Prejean. And Tom Weber, thank you. Thank you. Well, this has been quite a day, and I will not even attempt to summarize it. I would just say that what began today is going to continue. On March 7th is Law and Business Day of the Nobel Peace Prize Forum, and we will convene at 9 in the morning at the Ted Mann Concert Hall. The events that day will be on the University of Minnesota West Bank and Augsburg College campuses. And for those of you who are interested in seeing this conversation continue, it will continue on Law and Business Day. So step out to the computers in the lobby and register for Law and Business Day if you have not already registered. We would love to see you there. This is um, an opportunity for us to just thank you for being with us on the first ever Faith and Peace Day of the Nobel Peace Prize Forum. And we thank our virtual audience as well. We thank you for all your questions. We thank you for your inquisitiveness. And we thank you for helping us all shed light on how we cross boundaries to create common ground. Thank you. <laughs>